and welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm Ahu Kekahu Cardwell, and here we are today on the North Shore on the island of Oahu. We have a great guest for you, so let's go on over here and meet him. Ricky, aloha, how are hello. you? Good. Welcome to the show, Ricky Ortiz. Yes, great. And Ricky, tell us exactly where we are right now. Uh, we're in the valley of Waimea on Oahu, island of Oahu. So Waimea Valley? Yes, Waimea Valley. Wonderful. This is a beautiful, as I look around here, the beauty is just stunning. It takes my breath yeah. away. It's awesome. So Ricky, are you the caretaker of this place? Um, no, I'm not the caretaker. I'm uh, just uh, a loyalist to the Hawaiian Kingdom and taking up the responsibilities of acting as a konohiki, um, caring for the land and um, all the issues that uh, affect our culture and really? cultural sites. Wow, that's amazing. So back in ancient Hawaiian times of old, uh, the konohiki were the ones that actually were the, I guess you'd say the overseers of the stewards of the land, right? They yes. were like the managers of yeah. the people that actually did the work. It's all they, about land management. Land management system, yeah. and they were the ones that ran that system. Yes. So what you've done is you've taken actually the, the ancient system that is actually uh, a futuristic system because it works so well. Yeah. And you've taken it upon yourself to be the Konohiki, the land management surveyor and manager of this area. Yes, I'm not the only one acting in that capacity. Yeah. There are others that try to come in and, and um, take up that role, uh, which is all good. Yes. You know, we're not trying to just claim it for ourselves, but just to be sure that everything pertaining to the Aina is cared for. Right, because yeah. back in the old days, there wasn't just one Konohiki, there were yes. many Konohikis. Yes. Yeah, very good, very good. So, you, but you're doing this with the distinction we want to make is you're doing this as a Hawaiian Kingdom National. Yes. Yeah, very good. So, uh, tell us exactly why, you know, what caused you to want to, you know, get up out of your chair and say, you know what, this is something, I guess it's not that I want to do, but that I need to do, right? Yes. Tell us about that, what caused you to, to, to realize this is a responsibility you, you needed to take on? Uh, growing up, um, you know, feeling like we owned land and all the Hawaiian people around me <clears throat> and all the different families that lived up in Pupukea, where I grew up, uh, we felt that, um, well, I thought that they owned the land. But as I grew up, they all started moving out. Ah. And as they moved out, I was questioning, how come they got to move? Yeah. And it was, well, the owner's going to sell the land and so the family started to leave and there was just a handful of us left. So at that point I was concerned about, you know, where is our future? You know, where's all my friends going? Um, how are we gonna try to maintain keeping everybody close and attached to the land? And so it bothered me growing up and upon hearing about different individuals fighting for Kaolave, um, it, it sparked something in me to um, be interested in it, to study it. Then I got involved with all the different groups um, that was trying to achieve independence. And so it's all self-educational. It sure is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we know about that, yeah. So we, one thing we want to make clear is you don't get paid for doing this stuff. This no. is labor of love. Yes. This is something that you see as Kuleana, responsibility That's right. as Kanaka Maoli, Hawaiian, but also as a citizen the Hawaiian Kingdom. It's, it's a way to reassert yeah. the rights of, uh, as a citizen of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, as you said, Hawaiians, like most indigenous people on the planet, if they're disconnected from their land, from the Aina, they're like floating in outer space or something. Yeah. You got to be connected back to the land. Because you see, as they move out, you start seeing in the children, they start to change their ways and yeah. their process of thinking. Yep. And um, yep. they get in trouble, you know, they don't feel like they have hope or they're attached to anything. There's so, no grounding. Yeah, so um, those that do take up the fight are trying to stabilize that um, hope that we have, that we, we are attached to the land, we have rights. And, you know, you try your best. Uh, you got to work with what you got in your pocket. Right. Which, a lot of times, you know, you run out of run out of everything, and you got to just work in the areas that you actually can move around in. Right, uh, Ricky. How long you been? Uh, how long you been Konohiki? 
for this area here? How long have you been doing um, this? I don't consider calling myself Koniki, okay. but I am just acting out as that role. Okay. But I've been here, I would say, since uh, 1955. Really? And um, I, they used to actually take care of me in here when I was a baby by this family called the Nakagawas that used to um, manage the ranch in here that was owned by um, Bill Lacey and uh, this guy that has Tugman Steel. <coughs> So they helped raise you, raise you. Yeah. So you were raised right in this valley here. Yes. So you have you have, you have deep ties going back many 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 and practically your whole life to this valley. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, my kupunas also um, used to come in this valley a lot. Your kupuna going back many 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 generations. Yes. 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 Yeah. So really then from a very early age you had this feeling or sense that this was a place that took care of you, therefore you wanted to take care of it, yeah? Well, it didn't really hit me until I reached the age of um, probably like 25, before I realized that the importance of it. Um, I took things for granted, but I had a lot of fun running all over these mountains, exploring all the caves. So you get to know where everything's at, yeah, culturally. Yeah, 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 wow. Wow. So is it uh, is it difficult? Is it a difficult job to do what you do here? Um, is there a lot of stuff to do? The only difficult thing is trying to stay out of the Western idea uh, of how to make a living. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So it's not difficult physically. It's difficult up here. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's easy to get sucked back into that Western way of thinking, which is not land-based, but kala or yep. money-based. Because if you're not attached to the land, then you're paying rent to be on in some house or something. Somebody yeah. else's house. Yeah. So you got to take your time out to go and make the money to afford to um, house yourself, and then come run back out and take care of your cultural desires. So, Ricky, that's quite a balancing act to to keep, you know, like have one foot in each world. I understand what you're saying because on one hand you gotta, or with one foot I should say maybe, you gotta pay the bills and pay the rent, yep. but you can't let that mentality overpower you and have that be the dominant one. The other foot has to be the dominant one be, being of the, what we call it, the Kanaka Maoli yep. mindset. That's who you are, that's where you came from, that's where you're going to. Exactly, yeah. You know, and that has to be the one that is the operating state, yes? Yeah. And I'm not the only one going through this. You know, there's others that have lost even more than what I've lost. So, Ricky, give me an example of uh, something specific that you actually do here in the valley. Well, if you look over here on your right, uh, this is a project that I worked on. Um, oh, wow, look at that. And what we, is that? We had uh, an artist. Uh, by the name of Bill Braden, who had um, tried to put a trail marker um, on the North Shore. And uh, he got together with some kupuna from Wailua, Pupukea, Haleiwa area. And they all wanted to help him. So upon helping him, um, they had trouble with trying to find or get permission to put it you know, anywhere on the North Shore. It was shut down by the neighborhood board. And so upon trying to help, helping them and, and seeing what problems they were running into, you know, I, I told them, why are we asking, <laughs> you know? Just do, huh? The land is ours. Yeah. yeah. If we feel like we want to do it, we need to do it, then we just do it. And um, well, they asked me, well, where are we gonna do it? And I selected this space here. And uh, so then, I got everything organized for 11 o'clock at night so that there'd be no traffic. And I took a front end loader over to Waimea and we grabbed this large pahu in the middle. The big stone right there. Yeah, the, the big one yeah. and this second one here. Yeah. And brought it over. And then I went down to Sunset Beach and grabbed these large ones going around the side. Wow. wow. And brought it here. And there was a lot of it that I had stored up at my uh, parents' place up in Pupukea that came off of a rock slide that, that broke off over here in 2004. Hmm. 
and shut down the highway. Right across the street, practically. Yeah. And so we use, well, I used a lot of that debris to fill up the inside. And um, they, they, we pretty much ran out of stones. So uh, we had another rock slide here. And that provided us with the rest of the stones to fill in. Did that rock slide happen as you were doing this project? Yeah. Wow. Right when we ran out of stones. Wow. How about that? And so that? It, it was a blessing. Yep. You know, and yep. Um, I had uh, some run-ins with uh, OHA and Audubon Society over the building of this project because I did not ask them for permission. I just went ahead and did it. Mm -hmm. And so they tried stopping me. And my question to them was, what laws or statutes are you using uh, to prevent me from doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. you know, if I would stop, if you can come to the table and show me those things. So they set up a time and we came together, but there was no laws or anything that they could show me mm. that applied to stopping me. They called uh, DLNR, they called the state to try to have them to intervene and prevent me from building this. And they said that it was out of their jurisdiction. So all these state agencies were called into action, yeah. and nobody, they looked at the books, and nobody had any any legal way or right to stop you. The only thing that OHA uh, could do was, uh, at one point, they decided to let us go ahead and build it. Mm -hmm. And um, they said that, well, we need permits to build it. <laughs> and uh, there was no uh, structural engineering design for one of these. So Of course not. Um, you know, we had to get uh, in, an engineer to stamp it. But all of this efforts was done by the Kupuna. And I told them that that is totally separate from my belief. So I'm just going to go ahead and build. Um, so I just kept building. How long did it take you to, to, to put this together? Uh, it took me what felt like four years, but uh, maybe it was uh, three. Um, it was mostly... Um, most of the time it was myself and uh, two others that would come in. So just three guys did this whole thing? Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. And we had um, other people come and, you know, they'll put a couple stones on. Right. Just uh, a symbolic gesture as yes. um, being part of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so many Ohana, many families, many Pohaku, stones representing ancestors and kupuna yeah. are in here. Yes. So this is a highly symbolic uh, structure. Yeah, we had kupuna come from uh, all over the islands and up in the United States that had brought uh, pohaku from all over. Brought stones from all over the yeah. place in yeah. here. You know, wow. they vary in sizes from like um, a half inch in diameter to uh, say about almost a foot and a half. So very small to, to pretty good size. Yeah. Wow. And back in the old days, trail markers were very, very significant, yeah? Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, trail markers will um, guide you through um, an aapua'a so that uh, you can pass through without veering off the path and, and getting into trouble or, or uh, getting lost. So, uh, right. so it kept you from getting lost. It kept you from uh, actually stepping into somebody's backyard where you don't belong type of thing. Yeah. So they were they played a big role in, in, in old Hawaii. Yes. And they likewise play a significant role in, in, in the Hawaii of today. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, markers come in, you know, many farms, some with pohaku and some with wood. Mm -hmm. So yep. um, you'll have uh, carved tikis acting as a pohak, um, as a marker. So Ricky, tell us what Waimea Valley anciently was for, about. Well, it was an apua that had a lot of um, cultivating going on inside. And um, <clears throat> we have a heiau up on the bluff on this far side, Pumahuka, which was used for um, all the kapu uh, kahunas, the high priest, who would come here and learn about um, the stars. Wow. Uh, they, so astrology. Yeah, astrology. Wow. So and um, so most of it was cultivating and uh, living. Mainly. So it was agriculture, yeah. agriculture-based, but yeah. also it was a university 
for yes. Kuh uh, uh, Kahuna who were in, in modern day parlance, those would be PhDs. Yeah. And with a very sp uh, specialty, like PhDs are. Yeah. And they would be, they were the astronomers of the, uh, for the, for society, for the, for the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, so they could tell where you were and where you were going. Exactly. Wow. Ricky, you were saying that there is something very significant way up on the top of that ridge or mountain up there, yeah? Well, it's actually on the center ridge. Oh, over this way? Yeah. On the center ridge, okay. Yeah, in Waimea, there's uh, two valleys that split up. One is called the Salt Valley, which is the one we're in, and the other one is the uh, North Valley. Okay. So um, if you go up the North Valley, there's a switchback that leads up to the top of the center ridge, and up there is where I built uh, an ahu. Okay, and for our viewers, what is an ahu? Explain that. An ahu is a place where um, uh, it represents a, a spiritual belief, or a place to um, give offerings to your, you know, whatever you believe in. Mm -hmm. And um, it's usually a mound of pohaku or stone. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. And um, I started it. I would say about uh, maybe eight years back. Really. And um, so you went way up there to build this. Yeah. Wow. And I had people from all over the world that came and participated. Did they bring rocks? Yeah. Really? And they heard they heard about it, so they wanted to be part of it. Wow. So they would come, and I would go up in a full moon night and do it. And uh, so I had a number of people come up and give a hand. And um, most of the time, it was myself and one or two others. How but, big is it? Uh, it stands about, I would say, about five feet high um, by seven feet, seven feet square. And around it, there's a platform that's uh, about 15 feet, 16 feet in diameter. Yeah. So why did you build this? What's the significance of this ahu way up on that ridge there? Uh, there were several things I was trying to cover. Uh, one was before I put my foot in the valley to start to restore anything or to bring back my uh, cultural practice, I needed to plug in spiritually. Uh -huh. So that was showing my dedication to being Pono with the land. So if I could give all my effort as much as I could to it, then I would feel worthy of being in here and doing you know, my cultural practice. Gotcha. So it tied my uh, continuity of my cultural practice and spiritual beliefs within the valley. And it was also a way to let the ancestors know that you, what you were uh, about to do was Pono, had integrity, yeah? yeah? And asking permission to do it. Yeah. Wow, wow, amazing. So it sounds to me, Ricky, like you're building the Ahu up there really connects, you were connecting the past, the present, and the future. Yes. Yeah? Wow, that's amazing. I'm, I'm trying to secure the future for the Keikis. The kids. Yeah, so that um, because of the occupation by the United States, we slowly are losing our uh, Kuleana lands, our practices. So if I keep that continu continuity in place, um, then it allows the children of Hawaii to venture into that area and pick up, uh, take up that same practice and also all the things that go along with it. So the rights are, are still established under um, Hawaiian, Kingdom. Hawaiian Kingdom law and also uh, state law, yeah, American state law. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to cover that two cover your bases. bases. Yep, yeah. yep. Ricky, what do you see as the future for this valley? Because this is a beautiful, beautiful place, breathtaking. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It's an arboretum right now, but it's being misused. How? Um, the water is running by the land uh -huh. and not being utilized. Uh -huh. um, the water that is being utilized are being utilized on plants that we as Hawaiians cannot consume or um, we cannot partake of eating it. Uh, there's a lot that grows naturally that are herbs and medicines that we use, um, but there's a lot of land area that we're using for um, activities. Uh, Western style activities or and some cultural activities, which is good, but our people are struggling now and we need to put food in our mouth. And it's areas like this that uh, we get prevented from coming in 
and cultivating. So if we are given the opportunity to set up our um, lo'is and, and potato farms and stuff like that in these areas, um, we're bound to flourish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds to me like that's the next step is yeah. to get back in here, set up the lo'i, the, where, where, where taro, kalo is grown, yeah. the potato fields, to be able to grow the native diet uh, so that the people of the land, the Kekioka'aina, the, the Kanaka Maoli, can start to eat that stuff. Yes. It also sounds like what you are saying before about the water running by the land. They've got this set up right now pretty much like a postcard. Yeah. You know, a tourist postcard. It looks pretty. Yeah, it's beautiful. But it ain't doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like, to me like that's a tremendous waste, like a tragedy. Yeah, because part of land management is providing for the people. Um, if the land cannot provide for the people itself, it's no good. Then it's what use is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The land provides for the people. The people provide for the land. So by using it and providing, it shows that you're worthy of the land. Yes. So that's that's land proper land management. Yep, there it is, right there. You know, Ricky, we have a lot of viewers of our show, Voices of Truth, all over the world, and uh, as well as throughout Hawaii. And we always say the purpose of our show is to inspire our viewers to find their own kuleana, their area of responsibility, whether that's really small or yeah. medium size or large, doesn't matter, that they can go out and start to do, just like you did. Yeah. But we may have some viewers watching us right now who say, well, you know, that's a guy who's really smart, really motivated, really strong. What he did was great, but I could never, I could never go out and do something like that. What would you say to them? What message would you give them? If all of us was to have that same attitude, um, the distance between us achieving it and us not achieving it, well, well, the distance between achieving it will be greater. So we, we, each time we come up with an excuse, another day passes. And uh, it becomes weeks, months, years, um, and then at one point, it'll be too late. Uh, one of the key things is your water resources. Mm -hmm. um, if you start to divert the water away from the apua, you know, no matter where uh, in the world you live, you are taken away from a natural um, uh, environmental and uh, self-sustainable process, yeah? Mm -hmm that the land had worked in establishing without man. Mm -hmm. So you have to utilize the water, but bring it back into the same resource mm -hmm. and um, have it feed the fish and whatever else is down the river, whoever else might want to use it. Mm -hmm. But when you divert it far away, you're giving land that was never meant to have water on it to produce things that are not going to keep producing uh, for a long time and you're starving all the other life uh, downstream. Mm -hmm. So the, the equal balance you know, of the environment starts to shift. Yeah. And, and that's where um, we move further away from uh, achieving that self-sustainable ability. Yeah, okay. So just a moment ago, you said what happens if people don't act? The gap gets wider and wider yeah, and wider. Yeah, it gets wider and wider. So what happens if they do act, even just a few of them? What happens then? If they start to act, they'll find out they'll, they'll be running into uh, legal issues. Mm -hmm. So you have to uh, sit with um, people that are smart or educated, wise to uh, international law as well as domestic laws. Mm -hmm. If you take only domestic laws, they're controlled by legislative, uh, um, by legislature, which a lot of times are um, bribed by monies or um, contracts to sway away from uh, doing the truth, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you have to know your laws on both sides mm -hmm. so that you know what, what can cancel out um, the legislative decision. The other, yeah. yeah. And um, if you get all of those things in, you know, in place and then move on the land, you have a better chance. Um, the water is the only thing that is sovereign. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be sovereign 
it has to flow where it needs to go in order to balance nature. It has to be free. Yeah. It has to be free. Yeah. What I hear you saying is that if you do your homework, then you got a leg to stand on. Yes. Then you can move forward and make a real difference, not only in this valley, but throughout Hawaii for not only the Hawaiian kingdom, but for the people. Yeah. So Ricky, mahalo for what you're doing here in the valley. Please keep it up. I mean, this takes my breath away, not only the place, but I'm amazed at what the power of one individual can do. I hope people watch the show, get a hold of you, and say we want a kokua. I'll never stop. Please don't. Please Thank keep you. doing it. <laughs> mahalo for being on the show. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And to our viewers, mahalo for watching Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com. I'm Ehu Ke Kahu Cardwell, and until next time, ahui ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.